Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains seeking redemption. And yes, today we are going to do another top five list, but it's a sequel to probably my most controversial top five lists when I talked about five of the worst warships ever. Now, outside of repeatedly, annoyingly, like an idiot, mispronouncing Dunkirk as Dunkirky because I'd never seen it spelled the French way before, my apologies for that, nothing I said in that video was inherently wrong, but the arguments I got about it were that there's a lot of worse ships out there. A lot of my choices, particularly with the Dunkirk, aren't really that bad in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, they had problems, but not to the sense of worst ever. In fact, many of the more constructive comments I got poured me in the direction of other ships that are far and away worse, which I actually appreciate. So let's try this again, and we'll talk about five more of the worst warships ever. the Moskva-class helicopter carriers. Only two of these particular aircraft carriers, I mean, I guess that's technically right, but the Soviets would have called these helicopter cruisers, were actually built between 1962 and 1969, and they were in service between 1967 and 1996. They'd planned to actually produce at least three, if not 12 of them, and they do technically count as aircraft carriers, but their air wing composed entirely of helicopters. They weren't large enough for an airstrip like a full-size supercarrier would have. The idea was to have smaller ships designed for anti-submarine warfare. Helicopters are useful in that regard. They were conventionally powered by steam turbines, and they were capable of about 53 kilometers an hour, 28.5 knots. But, uh... That's actually not great for a ship of this size, and in fact, a lot of things about them weren't great at all. Pretty much everything involving these vessels wasn't so bad that they couldn't remain in service, but it was bad enough to be just disappointing in every conceivable way. Besides the speed issue, they also had terrible sea keeping and very poor handling. Neither the Moskva herself or her sister Leningrad handled well in any way, limiting their usefulness overall. They did keep them around because they could actually carry helicopters, they were good for that, but in terms of actually maneuvering, they were just kind of a dead end from a design perspective. The Japanese aircraft carrier Shinano. Oh, I'm excited! The Shinano's actually one of my favorite ships despite being awful, and in fact I have discussed her before but I doubt most of you are aware of it. There's a few very early videos on this channel that I made quite a number of years ago, and most of them are actually about ships. One of them's about the Yamato-class battleships, and that includes Shinano, which is probably already confusing you, because I just said she's an aircraft carrier. But the Yamato-class are battleships. But, uh, technically speaking, the Shinano is a Yamato-class. She is the lost sister of both the Yamato and the Musashi. Let me explain. Japan had originally planned to build three of the Yamato-class battleships, which are the heaviest battleships ever constructed. However, Shinano's hull was only partially complete when the Japanese lost four aircraft carriers during the Battle of Midway. This put them in a really bad spot. Uh, they really needed those carriers, and they didn't have them anymore. We sank them. They were gone. They were also starting to realize, as many countries did, that battleships were not nearly as useful as they once had been. The advent of aircraft made them a lot less effective, and the Yamato and Musashi kind of trucked around doing minimal work, especially when you consider the time, cost, and material investment it took to build those massive ships. Shinano wasn't even expected to be done until 1945. With the hull still being worked on, the IJN ordered her to be converted into an aircraft carrier. She was about 45% complete. Her structural work was complete up to the lower deck, and most of her machinery was installed. The main deck, lower side armor, and upper side armor around her magazines had also been installed, and the forward barbettes for the main guns, 
were also nearly finished. This put her in a really weird category overall, because she was being built as a battleship, not as a carrier. So the conversion at that point was a little complicated, and eventually they decided that instead of making her a full fleet carrier, they would make her a heavily armored support carrier. She would carry reserve aircraft, fuel, and ordnance in support of other carriers. A lot of her internals, particularly her machinery and propulsion, was actually identical to that of her sister's. And when she was completed for trials on the 19th of November 1944, she displaced 65,800 tons. Altogether impressive, but her work had been rushed horribly, and this is why she was so bad. The conversion was difficult enough, but had they done it right, it should have been fine. But no. She was put to sea well before she was ready. In fact, her captain, Toshio Abe, requested a delay in her departure. The majority of Shinano's watertight doors hadn't been installed. Her compartment air tests weren't completed, and there were a lot of holes in the bulkheads for electrical cables, ventilation ducts, and there were pipes that hadn't been sealed. Also, the fire mains and bailing systems lacked pumps and weren't operable. Most of the crew was experienced with seagoing, but very few of them had actually been trained with the portable pumps that were on board. His request was denied, and she was ordered out to trials as the Japanese needed that carrier in operation right now. It didn't go well for her. At all. Shinano had a really, really short career. She lasted 10 days. On the 29th of November 1944, she was hit by four torpedoes that were fired by an American submarine USS Archerfish. She wound up capsizing and sinking, taking about 1,435 officers, men, and civilian workers along with her. Included in that was Captain Abe and both of his navigators choosing to remain and go down with the ship. But Shinano's crew was large. 1,080 people that were on board did wind up surviving. And the heck of it is, had they actually bothered to take time when it came to Shinano's design, she probably wouldn't have been sunk quite so easily. She's the largest ship ever sunk by a submarine. But had the watertight doors actually been in place or the pumps functional, she probably would have been able to survive those hits. I can't guarantee she would have survived the war, since she would have been a high-priority target, and Japan was definitely on the losing end by the end of 1944. But still, the point still stands, that this is a case of a ship that was not only dealing with an awkward conversion from a completely different kind of ship, but was rushed. She was not in a state for battle readiness at all, or to be doing trials for that matter, and her crew paid for it. It's actually kind of a sad story in general. The USS Vesuvius. Okay, this is a weird one. Vesuvius was laid down in September of 1887, launched on the 28th of April, 1888, and finally commissioned on the 3rd of June, 1890. And she, well, as a ship, on her own, when it came to floating and moving and sea keeping and all that, technically speaking, she was fine. Like, she could do all that just fine. The reason why the Vesuvius is, um, well, considered pretty terrible, is because of the unique armament she kept on board. She was built pretty much as a test bed for three large dynamite guns. What the heck are dynamite guns? Well, the name suggests that they are powered by dynamite. They are not powered by dynamite. They do launch highly explosive projectiles, though, and they do this pneumatically. They're pneumatic guns using compressed air to throw the projectiles forward, rather than a conventional muzzle gun, which would use a controlled explosion. The reason for this is because, at that time, explosives in general were very, very, very unstable. You couldn't just put them in a regular old muzzle gun and expect them not to just explode in the barrel. But they were looking for a way to launch highly explosive rounds at targets. The pneumatic method seemed like a solution, but it wasn't actually that great. The guns themselves already had pretty limited range compared to traditional weapons. But Vesuvius's, in general, were also problematic because you couldn't actually aim them directly. The guns were locked in to the ship's deck. They stayed exactly where they were. In order to aim these guns, you had to aim the whole ship, as if the ship itself was a giant gun. The three barrels for the pneumatic dynamite guns faced forward, so the Vesuvius would have to aim directly at whatever the target was, keep steady, in the ocean, and fire that way. 
Oh, and she'd had to get pretty close, because again, limited range. The whole thing was not considered very effective. Vesuvius' guns just couldn't hit the target effectively. The only advantage to them, which was bizarre, but it kind of makes sense when you think about it, because the guns were powered pneumatically, they were actually very quiet. During the Spanish-American War, Vesuvius conducted several shore bombardments using her guns. The Spaniards that fell victim to these particular attacks were actually given great anxiety, as with conventional weapons, there's a great big boom before the impact of the shells. But Vesuvius' guns don't do that. They couldn't hear when she fired, so the highly explosive shells came in without warning. And in this particular job, the guns were actually pretty effective, but shore bombardment seemed to be all she was good for. Additionally, pneumatic guns were quickly proven to be obsolete, as more stable explosives that could be utilized in traditional cannons were developed, making the whole point of pneumatic guns, well, pointless. There was no reason to use them. Vesuvius did actually wind up used for other purposes, though. Eventually, she lost her guns, and she was given four torpedo tubes for conducting experiments with them. She was finally decommissioned on the 21st of October 1921, and stricken on the 21st of April 1922, to be sold for scrap. The Russian Monitor Novgorod. <laughs> okay, uh... This is, this is what you people watch me for. It's, it's for this kind of thing. This kind of, what, why would you ever, that's, that is, honestly, it looks more like a hovercraft than a proper ship. But I assure you, I promise you, that is a ship. A regular warship. Well, not regular, because it's a circle. A very, very odd circle. Why is it a circle? Well, that was actually specifically to reduce draft, which is the vertical distance between the waterline and the bottom of the hull, or the keel of the ship. The whole point of the Novgorod was to be a coastal defense ship. She could carry a lot more armament and more armor because of her really weird appearance. Her propulsion was actually fairly conventional. She used six compound expansion steam engines, and she wasn't really that large. She only displaced about 2,491 long tons. Now, there's actually a lot of exaggerations about the Novgorod that make her sound a lot worse than she really was. I wouldn't say she was particularly good, as there's a reason we just don't make ships this way. But... For her specific job as a coastal defense vessel, with the technology that was available at the time, she could have been a lot worse. She did have a lot of armor. She did have a lot of armament, way more than a conventional ship would have had being the same size. Many critics, even at the time, blasted her as being one of the worst ships ever, even then, saying that she had poor sea keeping, and she wasn't possible to control, and other things that aren't wrong, but aren't as bad as one would think. Her biggest problem is her inflexibility. She was only good for being a coastal defense ship. She was very slow. She was only capable of going about six and a half knots. That's 12 kilometers an hour or seven and a half miles per hour. She couldn't actually keep up with proper fleet ships. And her peculiar shape meant that she often fell victim to the ocean's currents way more often than a regular ship would have. She wasn't actually the only one designed like this, either. Vice Admiral Popoff was another circular ship built for the same purpose. Both have gone down in history as being some of the worst ships ever, and I would agree, but only loosely. Because they didn't get anyone killed, for one. They were technically stable in the water, but their lack of speed and sufficient control when compared to other ships definitely puts them on the low end. And that inflexibility when it comes to roles, unable to actually do anything beyond coastal defense, is definitely a weakness in my mind. Again, I want to lean into the idea of defending them at least a little bit, because I do think they're an interesting experiment and they're fun to talk about, but to say that they're good would be, well, a lie, because they weren't. The HMS Captain. Oh boy. On my first part of this, I got a lot of people pointing this one out, saying that you didn't talk about the captain and you should have talked about the captain. And you know what? No, you're right. I should have talked about the captain in the first part. I'm gonna talk about it now because wow. Wow, okay. 
there's a pretty major backstory with the captain as a ship that goes back to the Crimean War and a particular British captain by the name of Cowper Phipps Coles. In 1855, he and a group of British sailors constructed a raft that had guns that were protected by a cupola, and this raft, which they named Lady Nancy, was used to shell the Russian town of Taganrog on the Black Sea. It was actually very effective, and Coles himself wound up patenting this particular rotating turret design after the war was over. The British Admiralty was interested in the prototype of this particular design, believing it could enhance the effectiveness of their own warships overall. It was installed on the floating battery vessel, HMS Trusty, for trials in 1861. This actually went pretty well. The Admiralty was impressed with the concept of a rotating turret, and they ordered a coastal defense vessel, HMS Prince Albert, to be built with four of these turrets. They also ordered the HMS Royal Sovereign, which was a ship of the line that was still under construction, to be converted into a turret ship as well. Prince Albert wound up with four turrets mounting single 12-ton, 9-inch guns and 4.5-inch thick armor plate on the hull. Royal Sovereign had five 10.5-inch, 12.5-ton guns in one twin and three single turrets. They both had a flush deck and only a jerry rig, and that meant they could only operate as coastal service vessels. The Admiralty really liked the turret, but at the time still required ocean-going vessels to protect its worldwide empire. And steam engine technology hadn't quite caught up with the necessary speed and power you need on the open ocean. Ships of the 1860s that went out into the sea still needed to have sails. The sails in rigging proved complicated with the turret setup because it limited the turret's line of fire. It was possible to have a turret that could, in theory, hit the ship that they were mounted on if they were aimed improperly. The Coles thought there might be a way to make it work. In 1863, the Admiralty gave Coles permission to work with Nathaniel Barnaby, who was the head of staff of the Department of Naval Construction, to design a rigged vessel with two turrets and three tripod masts. However, in June that same year, the Admiralty suspended progress on the vessel until the Royal Sovereign finished her trials, as she hadn't quite gotten there yet. In 1864, Coles was allowed to start a second project. This time it was a rigged vessel with only one turret, and it was based on the design of HMS Pallas. The next year, 1865, a committee established by the Admiralty to study the new design concluded that while they, again, really liked the turret, Cole's warship design had inadequate firing arcs. The committee proposed a two-turret fully rigged vessel with either two 9-inch guns per turret or one 12-inch gun per turret. The Admiralty accepted the committee's proposal, and the construction was started on what would become HMS Monarch. However, Coles didn't take this well. They'd cancelled his original two-turret design for a ship like this, and then cancelled his single-turret design when they decided they wanted a two-turret design. He didn't think it was fair, and boy howdy did he raise just the biggest stink about it! He launched a campaign against the project for the Monarch, and he attacked Robert Spencer Robinson directly, who was the controller of the Navy, as well as various other members of the committee and the Admiralty. He was so persistent and irritating about this that in January of 1866, his contract as a consultant for the Admiralty was terminated. But at the end of January, his protests that he had been misunderstood, which, yeah, I believe you, not really, led to him being re-employed from the 1st of March, 1866. But Coles also lobbied the press and parliament about the issue, and through these methods he was able to force the Admiralty to allow him to build his own two-turret design. This would eventually become the captain. And I'm convinced, based on all of this, that they only gave in to just shut him the heck up, because he was being kind of a baby about this. Now understand that Coles, well, it wasn't that he knew nothing about ship design. He was a captain. He had sailed before, but he wasn't necessarily an expert on ship construction and architecture. There were a lot of things that he needed another person's opinion on and input in order to get right. And in the case of the captain, he probably should have taken a bit more advice from others. On the 8th of May, 1866, Coles told the Admiralty that he selected the Laird brothers of Cheshire to be the builder of the new warship. 
Cheshire had already built several successful iron warships, so they were plenty qualified to do it. In mid-July, Laird submitted two possible designs for Cole's proposed turret ship. To prevent the rigging from being damaged when the guns fired through it, it was attached to a platform that was mounted above the gun turrets, known as the Hurricane Deck, instead of being brought down to the main deck. Tripod masts were also used to minimize standing rigging overall. The design required the ship to have a low freeboard, and Cole's figures estimated it to be about 8 feet. This is not good at all. That's already a big red flag. Freeboard refers to the distance between the waterline and the main deck, or weather deck, of a ship. You've probably noticed that the vast majority of ocean-going vessels, particularly ones that travel, like, long distances in the deep ocean, have pretty high decks. And there's a reason for that. The ocean is rough. Waves are very high in the ocean. Riverboats, for example, don't need high freeboard because rivers don't have big waves. The ocean does. Any ship that's planning to spend weeks out in the ocean would need a decent freeboard in order to prevent water from crashing onto the deck directly. Eight feet is considered really low. Like, really low. I mean, that's only a little over two feet taller than me. And I promise you, there are waves in the ocean that are way taller than I am. Both the controller of Vice Admiral Sir Robert Spencer Robinson and the chief constructor, Edward James Reed, raised serious concerns about this. Robinson felt that the low freeboard could cause flooding issues on the gun deck. Really? No. I'm, for one, am utterly shocked by that revelation. And Reed criticized the design in 1866, both for being too heavy and for having a too high center of gravity. As the design work was nearing completion, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Sir John Packington, wrote on the 23rd of July, 1866, to Coles approving the building of the ship. But noting that responsibility for failure would lie with Coles and the builders. The contract was approved in November, and the design was finalized. She was laid down on the 30th of January, 1867, and launched on the 27th of March, 1869, finally being completed in March, 1870. The design had already been flawed even before they laid her down, but she actually wound up worse than intended. Coles had a protracted illness, so he wasn't often there to supervise her building, she wound up 347 tons heavier than she was supposed to. This is a problem because the additional weight forced her to float 22 inches deeper than they expected, and this meant the freeboard was down to just 6 feet 6 inches, and for goodness sake, that's only a foot higher than I am! Compared to the Monarch, which the Admiralty had been working on on their own, her freeboard was 14 feet. You see the difference now? Also, despite sitting really low in the water, somehow, and I still don't know how, the captain had a very high center of gravity. Chief Constructor Edward James Reed went into an absolute hissy fit over the design, but he was overruled during the captain's trials. She was officially commissioned on the 30th of April, 1870, and weirdly, despite the flaws, the captain's trials actually went really well. They even had her do gunnery trials versus the Monarch, and while the captain didn't actually do as well as the Monarch, the difference between the two wasn't actually that much. She lost, but only by a bare minimum. The Monarch fired 12 rounds during the trial and hit five times. The captain fired 11 and hit four times. The rate of fire on the Monarch was also a bit higher too, but the point is, as a firing platform, the captain wasn't necessarily that bad when compared to the Monarch, but firing of the turret revealed other problems. Due to the center of gravity issue, her being top-heavy, when she fired her first salvo, she rolled heavily in the water, 20 degrees. Also, it was estimated that if she inclined to 21 degrees, she would capsize. So what I'm saying is she almost capsized herself just by firing her guns. And this is under a controlled environment. It was the warship equivalent of a gun range. And we've been over this before. There's a big difference between firing a weapon in a controlled, clean gun range compared to firing it in the middle of a fight. If the captain was ever put into an actual battle where she'd have to maneuver, she might be able to easily capsize herself. But don't worry. I mean, you should worry, but not about that. Because she never made it that far. On the afternoon of the 6th of September, 1870, the captain was cruising 
with the combined Mediterranean and Channel squadrons that comprise of about 11 ships. These ships made 9.5 knots under sail in a 4-6 wind. It was noted by a visiting admiral that due to the low freeboard and the worsening sea conditions, waves were washing over the weather deck. The storm only grew fiercer during the night, and they had to reduce the number of sails. The wind was blowing from the port bow so that the sails had to be angled to the wind, and the overall speed of the ship was reduced. There was also considerable force pushing the ship sideways. This was bad. Eventually, the gale force winds caught the sails in the wrong way, and before the captain could order a correction to be made, the captain capsized, directly as a result of her design flaws. This resulted in the deaths of 480 sailors, and that included Coles himself, who'd been on board. Only 27 survived. The following inquiry basically revealed everything I just told you. The ship was poorly designed, and the Admiralty kind of in a weird way blamed themselves for giving in to public opinion. Due to the influence of outside forces, they'd allowed a ship that many of their own experts knew was flawed even before she was laid down, but they still allowed it to happen. In that way, it was kind of their own fault. Though I would say they probably would have blamed Coles more because he's the one that actually designed it and raised the hissy fit in the first place, but he wasn't alive to actually blame, so yeah. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Sundu 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dime Blade 17, Anzac A1, and Dozzy Wasn't. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.